You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Dr. Asim Malhotra, correct? Nice to meet you, James. Uh-huh. You got it spot on. Thank you, my brother. Good to see you. Doing God's work. Very outspoken. People should call you a whistleblower. Some will call you a conspiracy theorist. You're very well educated with heart disease, all this stuff. Pharmaceutical industry, big pharma. It's a big operation. Uh, probably one of the biggest in the world. One of the biggest killers in the world also, which we'll touch on. People then become scared of men like you. There's not enough people who have the balls, if I'm honest, to come at the forefront and speak their mind. I believe everybody's it's easy to quiet everybody down with money. Of course, money's the root of all evil. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm doing all right, mate. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Still, uh, you know, marching on. That's doing the best we, I can. You know, every day's a different day. That's all we can do, <laughs> brother. But before we get into all the dark stuff, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Yeah. Get more of a bit of an understanding about you. Yeah. Where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah, um, I grew up in Manchester, Great Manchester, a place called um, Tameside. Uh, my parents were both doctors. They moved from India when I was a year old. I had an older brother who was three at the time. And then, um, yeah, uh, I went to a local state school. Um, both my parents were GPs, you know, local GPs. And then went to a school called Manchester Grammar, which I uh, am very proud of. I think it taught me... Uh, gave me a lot of the, as well as my upbringing, you know, from my parents, especially my dad. I think Manchester Grammar School really reinforced um, the point about ethics and values, but also being becoming a critical thinker, the importance of critical thinking. In fact, our motto of the school was uh, in Latin, sapere aude. That means dare to be wise. And I didn't fully, James, appreciate what that meant until a few years ago. Basically, when you are trying to get out of your comfort comfort zone about what you believe, it takes a bit of courage to be able to do that, and even more courage to then, once you discover something new or something different, to then, which is you know for the benefit of human humanity and other people, there is a big challenge that comes with disseminating that information, right? Because people, you know, who may be fixed in certain views on a particular topic, let's say medicine or sugar or whatever. Um, are suddenly faced with having to change their minds. And that's not an easy thing to do. And if you're a protagonist for that change, there will be backlash. So that's part of the, you know, the the uh, the motto of the school is really just to, you know, we can only get to a greater truth if we listen to all different sides. So do you think your cards were kind of dealt with mum and dad being involved in the medical industry? I think so, to some degree, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Definitely had a bit of an influence. Um, my parents, although I know it sounds like a stereotype, but Indian parents, you know, want their kids to be doctors. Um, my dad, interestingly, uh, you know, he was um, he got into medical school on a sports scholarship. Really humble beginnings. I mean, he didn't even have shoes till he was eleven years old. He was the eldest of five kids, growing up in India, and uh, you know, he got into medical school because he was a great cricket player, and you know, he was a very very well respected, successful um, GP, probably considered James. I know NHS is a religion in in, in you know in the UK, uh, England, Scotland, you know Wales. It's a, it's a religion, and he has been named as probably the most prolific campaigner for upholding NHS values in the last three decades. So um, I think uh, you know there was a lot of influence there. But despite all of that, you know I think he wanted me to become a professional cricket player. So you know. I, I decided to choose. I chose medicine in the end. I think probably the right right route. So your dad was straight by the book, just everything believed in it. And uh, was there ever any signs? Obviously, because when people speak out against stuff, did your dad ever question any medicines back then? Yeah. Or was he just straight no, by the book? No, not at all. In fact, he was very holistic in his thinking. He always appreciated and 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 sort of I think influenced me to a large degree. That and and maybe this is some of my Indian heritage, you know, Hindu heritage and. Ayurveda and all that kind of stuff comes from India, that there was a more holistic aspect to health that was not based upon giving people pills. You know, I think he, he, he was a balanced doctor in that sense. Mm-hmm. You know, he wasn't an over-prescriber, you know? He was a guy that would try, you know, he was, patients loved him because he would listen. 
you know, and he would understand there were social problems. He deliberately chose James. I haven't been public about this before. It's interesting, you know, it influenced me in a way. Tameside, where I grew up, has is actually quite a deprived area. I think at one stage, if not now, it has the highest, if not one of the highest, teenage pregnancy rates in the whole of Europe, and certainly in the UK. And um, he deliberately chose to be a GP in that community because he felt he could help more people. So he was doing it from the goodness of his heart? Oh, completely. To try and make positive change? Yeah. What was it like going to medical school? Um, one of my dreams was to go to Edinburgh. You know, it's one of the oldest medical schools in the world. And uh, when I went and visit the city, I love Scotland. You know, I, I was you. like, I was like, no, seriously. I'll I was like, I fell that. in love with Scotland. And when I went there and I was like, I want to come to this medical school. So I did everything to get the grades to go to Edinburgh. Of course, it's a very prestigious medical school. Um, but again, even in Edinburgh, it was interesting. Like Manchester Grammar, there was uh, definitely a focus, I think, that encouraged us to think critically. Of course, you learn what you're taught, right? The, the basics of medicine and doctors. I mean, we, we don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. I think what doctors are very good at is diagnosis, diagnosing disease. Um, in fact, one of Edinburgh's most famous alumni is uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes. And what many people don't know is that Sherlock Holmes character, and Arthur Conan Doyle was a doctor. He was a medical student, obviously a graduate from Edinburgh. And what many, many people don't know is Sherlock Holmes, his character was modeled on one of Arthur Conan Doyle's professors of medicine at Edinburgh University, who was the most amazing diagnostician. So he'd sit in the consultation room waiting for patients to come in. And we're taught actually as doctors to pick up clues even before the patients open their mouth. So what are they wearing? Um, you know, when the patient walks into the consultation room, he'd look at the shoes and figure out which route they take into the hospital, where they're likely to live, what kind of job were they doing, looking at their hands, and therefore what are the likely diseases that may, they may be, you know, presenting with, or, you know, that, that's why they've come to see the doctor. That's how we start. And in fact, we come to make a diagnosis and Sherlock Holmes' byline and the way, and I, when I teach medical students, I would always tell them they're actually all detectives because the way that Sherlock Holmes would form, uh, would, um, uh, you know, um, uh, solve his murder mysteries, right? Was the same thinking when it comes to making diagnosis. So his byline was when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. So we use clues that patients give us through, and, and actually good doctors know that 80%, James, of your diagnosis, and this leads into a, obviously the other topic we're gonna talk about, and we learned this at Edinburgh, 80% of your diagnosis comes from the conversation, the history of the patient, what the patient tells you. If you ask the right questions and you listen, you're 80% likely to get the likely diagnosis and then you confirm it with examination, tests, investigations, whatever. So that was something that was very strongly inculcated into me at medical school, which always meant that I always never, you know, very rarely is a diagnosis 100% definitive. You've always got to think, is there something else that could be causing this? And because of that open-mindedness, I think that helped me become what I wanted to be as the best possible doctor I could be. See, when you're at university, is it just textbook after textbook to learn, to memorize yeah, there's a lot of that, 100%. Yeah, basic that, science. Do you see that now as programming? No, I don't think it's programming. I think, okay, so I think there's a lot of really good stuff. You learn about the human body and how mm -hmm. anatomy, organs work, yeah. anatomy and all that kind of stuff, physiology. I think the bit where medicine has failed or is failing right now is doctors are trained very much in terms of treatment. So diagnosis is one thing. Um, root cause is not addressed often. So if, for example, we were taught about high blood pressure, right? You can measure blood pressure. There are certain values where it, it, it becomes high and we know that's a risk factor. doesn't mean guaranteed, but you're more likely to have a stroke or a heart attack. We are then taught to treat that with pills that come from the drug industry, right? But there are two aspects to this, uh, James. One is we're not taught about root cause. In fact, we were told, and I think some of this is just ignorance, part of it, is that 95% of high blood pressure has no known cause. I know now, having graduated and qualified as a doctor for many, many years, over 20 years now, in the last 10 years or so, I discovered actually that we were told that blood pressure is essentially irreversible. It increases with time and you need pills for it. Same with type 2 diabetes. Irreversible, that's not true you can actually get people off pills through lifestyle changes. So that's something that medicine does not teach still at medical school. We were not taught it, which is huge, huge issue. 
The second issue is that the drugs that are prescribed to lower blood pressure or manage your blood glucose, whatever else, more often than not, in fact, most of the time, do nothing to prevent the complications of that risk factor. So I'll give you an example. There are degrees of high blood pressure, mild, moderate, severe. Most people on treatment in this country are taking pills for mildly raised blood pressure. What does that mean? Their blood pressure is above 140 over 90, right? The upper value and lower value when you get your blood pressure checked. Up to 160 is mild and on the, on the top value and up to 100 in the lower value is also mild. So, one, so between 140 over 90 and 160 over 100 gives you mildly raised blood pressure. Now, drug trials have been done by the drug industry, all right, by the drug industry, which is another problem because the data that they, the way the trials are designed, or the way they're analyzed, the raw data on those trials is never independently evaluated. But even if we trust them, their drug trials showed that treat, p treating people with mildly raised blood pressure, okay, most people with mildly raised blood pressure, there is no benefit, even if they lower the blood pressure with a pill, in preventing heart attack, strokes, or stroke, or death. And patients are not told that, right? And then they're subject to side effects. So essentially, the pills, in essence, for most of the people, have no effect whatsoever in benefiting them. They're not told that. They just think, oh, it's lowered my blood pressure. I must be better. When you do the trials and you follow people up, people given the pills versus people that weren't given the pills, there's no difference in their outcomes. That's something else we're not taught in medical school. So there's huge gaps in educating doctors around root cause of chronic disease and then the limitations of pills. doesn't mean pills don't have a role. And if you think about that on a grand scale, James, that's, I mean, that's a massive, massive problem in terms of wasting resources, unnecessary harm, because patients are not given alternatives in terms of diet, dietary change, cutting sugar, whatever. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that the best thing medicine does, to be honest, is acute care. If you have a you know, road traffic accident, if you did emergency bypass surgery, if you've had a cardiac arrest, you need a defibrillator, you know, these are some of the best things we do in medicine. Really good, slam dunk, amazing. But the biggest issue right now in healthcare is managing chronic disease, and we are not doing that very well at all. Yeah, because the UK, I think even worldwide, I think the age, people are not living as long, and the majority of people are in chronic pain. So that tells you that if the industry, the pharmaceutical industry isn't working because they're feeding people pills. And the thing is about doctors, people believe their doctor 100%. They think they're only, and listen, I'm not here to slate doctors because they do an amazing job, doctors, nurses, yeah. unbelievable. But like you say, you're at the, you're reading by the book, you're getting programmed for then believe this and you're finding other alternatives to exactly. then make changes so that the doctors aren't going to question it because they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah. So it's to, like I said before we started and also every podcast, yeah. it's to question everything. Yeah. And it must be difficult for a the, doctor to then be promoting something and not want to go against the grain and someone's buying into it even though it's destroying their life yeah it's crazy yeah the intention of most of the people who work in the profession is is very pure right um that's one of the things that i'm really proud about being trained in britain working the nhs going to a british medical school i honestly think probably the best medical training in the world right but um we are definitely falling short on obviously all these things we've discussed already about managing chronic disease. And part of the problem, James, which you've already alluded to in a way, is the medical profession itself is hierarchical and obedient, which is a risk factor for abuse of power. So what does that mean? You're right, doctors um, are rarely people that tend to go against the grain. They're the kind of people that went to school, did what they were told, got the good grades, right? Passed their exams, they're not generally by nature, and of course everyone's different, rebellious. And because of that, that becomes an even bigger challenge for people like me. But what I would say as a doctor and to other doctors and healthcare professionals listening, our primary duty and responsibility is to our patients. And one of the most important first principles of medicine, first do no harm. So we have to always remember that the medicine and science around medicine is going to evolve. I mean, that's another thing we don't get taught in medical school, which is actually, you know, a quote, and this has actually been proven with, with, with data um, the, uh, from Professor David Sackett, who was considered the, fa the father of what we call evidence-based medicine, practicing medicine causing, according to the best available evidence, which means look at all the information, James. You've already said that, but a lot of doctors are not doing that. And even if they are, the information they're using on drugs has been 
corrupted by the drug industry. And he said 50% of what you learn in medical school will turn out to be either outdated or dead wrong. Within five years of your graduation, the trouble is nobody can tell you which half. <laughs> so you have to learn to learn on your own. And I think doctors generally don't do enough of that. And they trust, as jobbing doctors trust the guideline bodies, you know, the chief medical officers, the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. They think those are the experts and they've done independent evaluations. And the problem is that isn't the case. And that's why they carry on doing what they're doing. But 50%, can you imagine the amount of people who have lost their lives, lost lost loved ones by the wrong medicine, the wrong information, yeah. because they never looked at every avenue. And it's difficult because you look at amazing people, Barbara O'Neill, Dr. Sebi, with the natural things in life. Now, yeah. like I say, with the pharmaceutical industry, is there any stuff there must there must be stuff there because people do it does change lives and help people to get to a better state where they can kick on but is there good medicines in that medical there industry? is but this is the this is the issue let's okay so there's some slam dunks in medicine that we know you know antibiotics for its infections life-saving all right um you know emergency heart surgery or keyhole heart surgery something having a heart attack life-saving okay um the problem we've got is the drug industry have got so much power. I'll, let me give you an example, right? So statins are a drug that are very commonly prescribed. One of the lucrative drugs in the history of medicine, estimated to be prescribed to between 200 million and a billion people worldwide. I mean, it's massive, right? Now, if you look at the data on statins and you break it down for patients in the way they can understand. So if I'm having a conversation with you, for example, and we have a chat and I say, James, you're low risk of a heart attack in the next, whatever, five, 10 years, then your benefit from taking a statin at best is one in a hundred based upon drug trials done by the drug industry, right? So this is likely still best case scenario. You'd be like, what? 1%? You're not told that, right? That's one thing. But the reason I'm mentioning that is you'd think you don't, we don't know who that one person's going to be. Now, there is probably a way with time and with good science to work out who is going to be the person that benefits from the statin. Who's the person that's going to benefit from taking statin where they're going to have a heart attack or stroke prevented but it's not in the drug industry's interests why because that's more precision medicine you're going to narrow down the amount of people prescribe the drug and they don't make profit from that so actually that's another big issue they are there the drug industry's business model besides being fraudulent and and is to get as many people taking as many drugs for as long as possible. If they could, they would start babies on statins. If they could, they would affect the law by influencing politicians to mandate statins for babies. I debated this, the, uh, the chief executive of AstraZeneca, Pascal Sauteris, in the Cambridge University Union in 2019. And the motion that was put forward was, it was actually called, we need more new drugs. But what they were saying was, we need more people taking more drugs. That is their business model, James. And they are pathological or psychopathic in the way that they go about exerting that power so they can get more people on more drugs. But this is the way the world operates through greed. So we do with money. Absolutely, mate. All it's greed money. and it's a system, it's the economic system. It's it's corporate capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, you hear these things, these terms thrown around free market, right? Sounds great. You know, let people innovate, do what they want to make money. Okay. But obviously there are gonna be limitations there. The free market should be that, and no one will have an issue with this, James. I have no problem with people making money doing the right thing, being honest and transparent with whatever it is, whether it's buying a mobile, new mobile phone or a car, you want to know exactly what you're paying for. The problem is the whole system is geared where people are deceived for the purpose of profit. And when it comes to health, it's not just about, you know, buying a car or paying extra money and think bloody hell this car wasn't as good as i thought it was this is putting drugs into your body that are going to affect your mental state your physical state your longevity it may cause a death of you uh, prematurely or a family member i mean this is really important stuff they have got to the state where they are literally and i i, I spoke in the european parliament again around that 29 2018 i think it was um they are killing for profit mate they're killing big food big pharma are killing people for the purposes of profit they're all linked the bad foods create the disease and their tablets enhance the disease. Matt Letizia says it when I had them on, they're creating, they're creating customers, not cures. Yeah. And it's a sad reality because we believe in it so much and this is what scares me about human beings. And I don't want to be negative about them, but we're very easily dumbed down. We're very easily manipulated because we genuinely think people 
are good. And that's a sad reality because when there's bad things happen in life, human beings naturally want to help. Of course. And if everybody was to awaken, not even everybody, just 1%, that could awaken to then question everything that's going on. The world would be such an amazing place, but with so much greed and power, for me, I always say it, money's the root of all evil. You take away the money, you take away the power, you take away the greed, you take away the destruction because nobody's yeah. got anything to kill for. And this is a sad reality. The pharmaceutical industry, um, you've got ch child trafficking, you've got the drug industry. It's, they're all in par food with industry, each other. Food industry, getting addicted to processed foods. It's all in par with each other yeah. to then cause mayhem, destruction, pain. And that's the sad and thing. And it's a machine, yeah. you know, it's not, it's almost like it's out of control that has been created or has got worse over time um, because of an ideology, a belief system that we are all intrinsically selfish and the way to manage society in the world is to convince people that you don't, we don't need each other and we can, you know, reach a good state of being and happiness in life from, you know, um, you know, just sort of selfish desires, if you like, mm -hmm. whether it comes to food or cars or where you look or whatever else. So it's a problem of materialism as well. You know, basically, what does that mean? You as a person pay, put more value on your belongings, your image and your status than you do on human beings and relationships. That's basically what materialism is. And it's destructive, yeah. massively destructive. Listen, we've got all of that, a little bit of that in the nature. The problem, James, is it's become the dominant side of our character now in many in many ways. And there is a, a system and a culture that has got us to this place. And we're now realizing, hold on a minute, we're more miserable. Mm. You know, there's more mental health problems than we've ever had. The most number one chronic disease um, uh, issue is mental health issues. Uh, and uh, our physical health is going downhill. And you said earlier, actually, life expectancy is stalled in the UK since 2010. And there are more people who are sicker. So basically, we are going backwards, not forwards. Mm -hmm. Devolving. Absolutely. So it's time to change the trajectory. And, and that is not um, the solutions, the actual ev the evidence and the education and solutions is relatively simple. The implementation is hard because you're up against big pharma who are going to lose out. And they don't want to. Yeah, when you create a voice and try and awaken the masses, it becomes difficult. You know yourself, the comfort, you, the discredit, you, accusations, false imprisonments, death, that it ain't easy because they've got so much power. They do control the world. It yeah. controls the whole world. The world is operated, like I said earlier, through greed. And it's a sad reality. 2019, you get fired from NHS, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, what actually happened was um, I was working in a hospital called Lister Hospital in Stevenage. I've been there for three years. Uh, I was doing part-time consultant there because I do a lot of other things as well. So, you know, but I was doing, you know, th three to four sessions in the NHS a week. I really enjoyed it. And um, a month after the mail on Sunday, within a few weeks of the mail on Sunday, doing a hatchet job on me, that's how I describe it, and two other, one of the um, obesity researcher I know well, very respected, and a GP called Malcolm Kendrick. Um, I basically got a, a, a text message saying my services are no longer required. And although they didn't explicitly say it was that, I knew it was that. The, the hospital was named, or, and that was the most like. And then I couldn't then get any jobs back in the NHS because I would apply to different places or reach out to cardiologists I knew or who knew me. And, they, and James, let me make one thing very clear here as well. Uh, and people can look this up. My clinical record as a doctor is impeccable. All my appraisals... Um, and maybe it's a luck thing. I've never had a single patient complaint in my career, which is unusual, partly because I, I pride myself on communication. You know, patients want to know that you care. And I, I know, you know, so all of that was, and there were cardiologists said, listen, we want to help you. We'll get you back in, whatever. Probably about eight hospitals I reached out to at different times where I knew a cardiologist and said, yes, yeah, we'd love to have you here. The way it works, and this is part of the hierarchy, and this is a downside of the NHS or medical hierarchy, is that let's say there's eight cardiologists in a cardiology department in a hospital. Seven of them say, listen, we'd love to have a seam on board. One of them says, no, they don't want to rock the boat. Sorry, a seam. But the reason I'm mentioning that is every time the reason that was given essentially was because of that mail on Sunday hatchet job, a seams, you know, a statin denial or whatever else. I never was. I'm all about shared decision-making, informed consent. I'm obsessed with it give patients information the way they can understand. And I've never been called out on it. I've always got it correct. Um, I published in peer-reviewed medical journals on this. But the Mail on Sunday 
they smeared us and they did something called what we call a straw man argument. They painted us, um, they painted our position on statins as an extreme version of itself. So rather than say that I was actually all about evidence-based medicine form consent, Dr. Mahotra is a statin denier. He says statins don't work. Complete bollocks, pardon my language, mm -hmm. absolute bollocks. But that stuff stuck and it, you know, the good news, James, is that only a few weeks ago, um, my mum had just died in that, in, at the time, 2019, it's and really I was clever. asked to, yeah, I was asked to, by two of the other people, whether I wanted to get involved in suing their mail on Sunday for libel, and defamation. And I made a decision, you know what, it wasn't worth it for me, I'm just gonna carry on doing what I'm doing. In fact, I did more work and managed to get in the news that we need to inquire into statins. I got the editor of the British Medical Journal involved. So I thought, you know what, let's just keep pushing forward. I'm not gonna be, you know, put off by this. And of course, I went into only private practice, which is not great. Um, but you know, it's not what my, my passion is, but I have to earn the money somewhere. And, um, and these two other, uh, doctors, Dr. Zoe Harkham, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, they decided to sue the mail on Sunday for defamation. And only a few weeks ago, then obviously called COVID happened. So it got delayed. Um, they won the case. They were unbelievable. This is a, you know, uh, and the BMJ has have written it up. Um, it's the first time I'm talking about it on a podcast. And that's massive, massive. So now, obviously, there's an appeal phase, but there may be damages, but it's a moral victory, nonetheless. But think about all the damage it's caused. It had, it literally ruined my NHS career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is a sad reality of it. When they do the hatchet job, it sticks. Yeah. And obviously, now you've got the, the rewards of winning, but it's a, and you just try to go on with your life. But what about the last five years? It pushes people over the edge, yeah. suicidal, on the brink loss of family yeah. members like i say it's a struggle of yeah. everything else you're trying to go up against yeah yeah it was it was hard and it definitely played a role in i think you know um there i had a i had a bout of depression at the beginning of 2021 um there was so i wrote a book on statins as well there was a lot of pressure and stuff going on so it would have definitely played a role um it hurt my dad a lot you know um he was very always very supportive of what i was doing he never said a scene don't do it he was the kind of guy i mean he was you know, he came from a background where he was a student leader in India and got put in jail twice for, you know, calling out corruption, you know, by Indira Gandhi, the prime minister basically ordered the arrest of, of him and other people. So he was that kind of guy. So he wanted me to also, you know, always stand up for truth and for patience. But, you know, obviously got him worried and concerned, like, you know, what's going to happen to Asim's career. But I just marched on, mate. You've got to have a thick skin. Um, it's really hard, but you know, it knocks you down for a while, and then you get up and you just I've got, you go, you go, you get up and you're strong, and you think more deeply about why you're doing what you're doing, and it gives meaning to your life. And you just think, I'm going to do better next time in terms of how do I push this message forward? How do I articulate the truth in the best possible way that's going to resonate with people? And I know in my own heart, James, I'm doing it from a intention of only doing everything I can to help my patients. It comes from pure intentions. I know that in my own heart. So that's what keeps me going. And that, that gives me some strength. Now that's what it comes down to. You've just got to keep showing up. When they knock you down, you've just got to try and push forward and show up, stand yeah. up again and go forward. Absolutely. Knock you down again, you just keep going again. But it does become stressful in the mind for the, because you've won awards as well. You're very, um, with heart disease and um, cholesterol, like, what is the connection with heart disease? Obviously, I know people say it's you've got alcohol, cigarettes, bad foods, but yeah, stress and that stuff plays a part. But what is the connection with heart disease? And is heart disease the biggest killer? And the, on the yeah, planet? it's the biggest killer in the of um, in European men. Uh, probably the biggest cause of premature death globally. What do you think so, the link to that is? Well, I think it's a combination of factors. Traditionally, for a long time, and I know it's still a big issue in some of the more deprived areas of the country and in Scotland as well, because I saw that as a junior doctor. Smoking was a massive risk factor. Smoking's gone down, and death rates from heart disease dropped dramatically from, say, 1980 up until about 2010 because we reduced smoking, right? That was a big risk factor. Type 2 diabetes, again, related to weight gain, sugar, ultra-processed foods, high blood pressure, which we've talked about. The cholesterol issue is one which is quite controversial. I've been very heavily involved in that. High cholesterol itself is not a major risk factor for heart disease in the way that most people understand it, uh, unless you have a genetic condition which affects one in 250 people called familial hypercholesterolemia. But what's happened is they found that those people had a significantly risk, increased risk of heart disease and presumed that if everyone's cholesterol got lowered, then it would, you would get less heart disease. And that 
never worked. Um, despite all the drugs and all the prescriptions, the real world data tells us over, you know, 10, 20 years, death rates from heart disease going down has no clear attribution to people's cholesterol levels dropping. It's a big myth, James, to be honest. And um, everyone believes that though. I know they do. And and the thing is, it's a huge industry around it. It's a trillion dollar industry. So it's not it's gonna take time for that myth to be busted. I, I started must you know, busting that myth, if you like, in the BMJ, 2013. I was a junior doctor then, and I wrote an article called Saturated Fat is Not the Major Issue. And it basically said, you know, looking at all the information, going to detail, putting the jigsaw together, it was peer reviewed, eight hundred words made world news though because they press released it and it was front page of three British newspapers etc but basically what I said is that eating saturated fat from things like red meat and butter right um, does not cause heart disease it does raise cholesterol though but hold on if it doesn't cause heart disease and it raises cholesterol that means cholesterol is not a major risk factor for heart disease so I said yep so I explained that but if cholesterol isn't a major risk factor for heart disease how do statins work even that one in 100 benefit and I knew that statins had another um, uh, property other than lowering cholesterol, which is they, they, are, they have anti-inflammatory and anti-clotting effects. And that's why they're preventing heart attacks, not through lowering cholesterol. But the drug industry don't want you to do it. Know that because um, both the food industry and drug industry profit from the fear of cholesterol. So people get prescribed statins, but also um, the uh, other drugs that they were developing to lower cholesterol, once statins went off patent, would allow them to get this mindset and get this thinking that, okay, we've got some other drugs that can lower cholesterol even better. It doesn't matter whether low cholesterol has an effect on you, but if you think it does and you believe it does and you're scared of it, great, great for business. Loads of people prescribe cholesterol lowering medications and it's a massive problem. It's ongoing now, um, partly because I think the drug industry are profiting from the false belief, James, that they have saved the world with the COVID vaccine. So this is our opportunity Let's get more people and more drugs, mate. It's exactly, uh, this was the Cambridge University Union debate with me and other people and the AstraZeneca CEO was all about that. And I thought, here we go. We need to stop these guys because they're going to use any opportunity to get more people on more pills. See, in Scotland, why is it so high? All of a sudden, all the Scottish people like to drink, smoke. Does sunlight play a, the, can sunlight play a massive part on the stress yeah. of the heart? Because yeah, no, I think, well, vitamin D definitely has a role. If your vitamin D levels are not optimal, and in fact, majority of people certainly in Scotland and even the UK, have not got vitamin D levels in the optimal range. At the lowest level of vitamin D deficiency, you can have a six-fold increased risk in heart disease from some research. There's that, that plays a role. I think the diet's a big thing, James, to be honest. Um, and a lot of it, again, you know, there, there is definitely, there is a role that we have to play about taking responsibility. However, most of it is being driven by environment. You've got people on not even minimum wage, You've got cheap ultra-processed food everywhere. What do you expect them to eat, you know? And then they're going to get heart disease. And this is a big problem. So, you know, we have to think about the, the system. And by the way, it's not like they're even told the truth about those foods. You know, they're actually, those foods are being designed to get you addicted. And addiction is the opposite of free will. And then what they do is they then push pro pro propaganda. The food industry then push propaganda. It's your fault, you know, exercising enough while they're getting you hooked to their foods. It's psychopathic, James, completely psychopathic. That's what these, these people do. And they get yeah. you and they create a, a narrative where people are arguing about exercise and obesity rather than, hold on, the food industry have engineered the food to get you addicted to it and then get you arguing about exercise when in fact we should be getting the addiction, the, the, um, we should be changing the food environment. Yeah. There's a lot of people on welfare and stuff as well. I remember my uncles used to be happy about getting sick notes from the doctors so they could get more money than their house paid for. So they did. They were so happy. Yes, another sick note, another month, another three months. Used to pretend. But, used but, to but, give but, them tablets. But, that, but what kind of life is that? Though? It's no life. It's not life. No life. They might think, you know, yeah. But, yeah. but that's a lot of people in from the area. I was raised in a deprived area in yeah. Glasgow, and that was the kind of that's the best they could do, though. Work and just getting cheap foods. And yeah. there was a place called Saracen Street. It had bookmakers, chip shops, um, pubs. It was just all garbage. That's all they had. That's all they could go towards. And yeah. it's sad because human beings have got so much potential. They've got Completely. so much greatness to do amazing things. Yeah. And like I say, we're just, the media plays a massive part in how people see the world. Yeah. So big pharma companies, are they just coming up with scripts, putting it in the medical industry and people are just buying into it and pushing it out the door? 
Essentially, yeah. A lot. I mean, there's there's a few drugs obviously have an effect and do good things, but most of what they do now, certainly last couple of decades, they're just producing copies of old drugs, pretending it's something new and innovative, changing the name, patenting and making money and then moving on to the next one. And um, at the same time, when you look at what does, what can modern medicine do for your life? Of course it has a role, but in the big picture, grand scheme of things, when it comes to life extension, since 1850, We've added, say, average life expectancy in 1850 was 40 years old, right, in Britain, all right? Now it's whatever, approximately 80, let's just say that. So we've had about 40 years of life expectancy. Most people, when asked, would think that modern medicine has been responsible for that when it's not. Um, maybe added about three and a half to five years of that 40 years to our life expectancy. Most of what determines your health are the conditions in which you are born, grow, live, work, and age, and the drivers of those conditions, right? You know, um, access to healthy food, you know, housing, fair wage, you know, feeling control of your life so you're not extra stressed, so you can live the life you want to lead. This is what determines your health, James, more than anything else. What about Alzheimer's? Because you're talking the 50s, the 60s, it was relatively unknown. Now it's one of the biggest killers. Why? Um, direct link of Alzheimer's disease, partly to uh, type 2 diabetes, which has gone up. So the, the underlying mechanism that's thought to cause Alzheimer's disease as many, in many ways, the same risk factors for heart disease is called insulin resistance. So your body gets resistant to the hormone insulin over time. Insulin, when it's pushed out in excess in response to basically food, right, and predominantly, um, is directly toxic to the heart arteries, to the blood vessels in the brain, etc. So I think that's one of the mechanisms. But about 70% of people with type 2 diabetes, and this is another reason why we should try and reverse type 2 diabetes for people who have got it, and it can be done. 70% of those people will ultimately develop some form of dementia. There was, they were even thinking of renaming Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. So that's gone up. Um, along with, to be fair, certainly since whatever the 50s and 60s, we have had a bit of an increase in life expectancy since then. So some of that is also an aging population. But of course, that's now stalled. And Alzheimer's is still a big problem. So I think it's, um, it's mainly that. How bad is sugar? Um, listen, who doesn't like sugar? You know, I, I grew up on sweets and cakes and, you know, who doesn't like ice cream? The problem is it, instead of it being the occasional treat, it became the predominant for a lot of people still something they're eating three times a day. And the problem with that is it, it's going to be affecting your, your, um, your insulin levels It's going to cause insulin to go up over time. And that's going to then drive disease over time. Forget it, you know, not on, we've got issues of tooth decay in children, which is a, one of the most common cause of chronic pain in hospital admissions. Um, and primarily driven by sugar. You've got the effect on the gut microbiome that basically feeds the bad bacteria and, and inhibits the good bacteria that drives inflammation in the body. So there's nothing good about sugar other than the fact that it's nice as a treat every so often and will not do you harm if you're having it once a week which is, I think, how you, people used to eat it, James, in the f 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? Um, initially, that it, was, it wasn't that much of a consumption of sugar there is now. So um, it doesn't give you any nutritional value. There's no, there's no need for it at all. What do you think of chemo? Um, I w I'm not an expert. What I can say is there is a big, again, uh, not enough of a conversation going on about cancers and what chemo can offer people in terms of life extension often it's only maybe a few weeks and then it's all about individual preference are patients fully informed would they rather live a better quality of life for a shorter time than a poor quality of life for a longer time i mean that's really the major issue with chemo what do you think of natural remedies when you see people with cannabis oils and mixing different plants that cures tumors and like, I'm not an expert on it myself, but like I say, Barbara O'Neill, who's, I think she's banned from Australia, they're trying to sue her for like 54 million, I think it is, because she was very outspoken against the vaccines. But what do you think of natural remedies grown from the earth that help cure people? The first thing I would say is, talking about natural remedies, uh, the most important driver, and there's lots of different drivers, about of our health and deteriorating health is food. We can't fix the NHS or healthcare until we fix the food. And that's obviously a natural remedy for, for a lot of the problems. And I, you know, I use that very at the forefront of my practice with patients to get their type 2 diabetes reversed, get them off their blood pressure pills, etc. In general, James, I think we have to have an open mind about it. But I think the other side of it is also we have to be careful that we don't 
over exaggerate claims for example on whether cannabis oil cures cancer for whatever else you know if that's helped somebody and they've happened to have their cancer cured and that they believe that was the cause of it amazing but it then needs to have further proper studies done independent of people who are profiting from it to actually know for sure, is it helping cancer? If it is, how much is it helping, right? With anything we do in medicine, with any intervention we do in medicine, a doctor has to ask themselves, and this can apply to uh, natural remedies as well, how much difference does it make? And how do I know this? So that's for the practitioner to, mm -hmm. you know, and the patients to ask those questions. Yeah, because it's, very important to just look at all aspects, but people don't have the resources or the intelligence no. to question it. And look at the man who created the car to run on water in the 80s, 1980s, 1990s, killed off. You know, like things can be changed. And I believe, what do you think of the placebo effect? Yeah, that, yeah, it has a role for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that also tells you the power of the mind. If someone genuinely believes something or in a doctor, then I think they're more likely to get better. Absolutely. Because I read something... Pa that, the power of positive yeah, thinking, right? when I read something about someone says about when they tell a patient they've got cancer, apparently their immune system drops 80%. Is that true? Uh, I mean, I don't know that figure, but it doesn't surprise me. So it's in the, the mind, shock effect. Yeah. And it's great, like I say, believing in a doctor and listening to what they're saying and then getting that bad news and then boom, you yeah. manifest that. 2020, lockdown. Biggest scandal <laughs> in, my, in my lifetime anyway. And there's been many, but um, yeah, lockdown for me. They said it would last, I think, three days or three weeks. And it went on nearly two or three years. And like I say, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I've got very good intuition to then something's not right here. Like I say, I've had vaccines in the past. I've got a BCG in my arm, a of big course. scar, but I don't know what that's from. Yeah. I think it used to be for like mumps and other stuff. And I'm not here shitting on every vaccine um, because I'm still here. I took lots of drugs when I was a kid, lots of alcohol, probably done more damage than some of the vaccines that I got. But now that I'm at a stage, I understand what I put into my body. I understand, okay, does that make me feel good or will it make me feel bad? And with the vaccine... Um, then Pfizer came out and I read stuff about them in Nigeria, stuff that they'd done. I think they were killing kids um, with a vaccine that they created. I believe they got sued for it in the early 2000s. Um, I read that it was a 99.9% survival rate and it more affected older people over 70s and 80s. So I thought, nah, that's not for me, that. And um, I did question it, though, because I don't want to hurt people. I believe I'm a good person who tries to do the right things, but I just kept myself to myself. And when you decide to do that and go against the grain, you become a target. And then it makes you question, okay, should I just do what everybody else does? And thankfully, I never. Um, I believe I made the right decision. But when 2020 comes, lockdown, you're a doctor, you believe in a lot of the medical stuff that you're, you're doing. Vaccines, like I say, there must be good vaccines out there. But... When lockdown comes, what are you thinking? What do you what are you thinking at I'm this stage? I'm trying to remember when I was going back. Initially, it was a bit of what's really going on here, um, and you know, I probably went along with initially thinking, okay, maybe lockdown is the right thing to do at the very beginning. But I thought after a while, you know, I started to think a little bit outside the box and look at what other people I respected were saying about. I think one of the problems, James, at the beginning was for a lot of people is not really knowing what the actual true infection fatality rate from the, from the, um, you know, from the virus was, from COVID was. Um, and just to give you an example of the discrepancy between what people believed and what the truth was, you know, one survey in America um, revealed in, 20, in early 2020, that 50% of Americans thought that their risk of being hospitalized with COVID was about 50%. As in, if there was a one in two chance when the actual figure was, you know, less than 1%. So the massive difference, right? And that creates a fear in people's minds. So I was trying to figure out just how bad this virus was. And actually early on, I remember I went on Sky News in, I think it was March actually, 2020. And you know, that, that slogan that Boris Johnson came out was was stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. And I and I looked at the data coming through from Italy about the death rate, you know, who was dying. And I remember, never forget this figure, the average age of death from people from COVID in the first wave in Italy was 81, right? And they had 
2.7 average comorbidities in terms of up to th- almost three conditions, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, whatever. It's like, well, okay, this seems to be a, a virus predominantly affecting the elderly. So why are we locking down the whole country? That was the first thing I thought. But I went on Sky News to say, listen, we know that the people who are at risk from dying from COVID are the same people who are at risk of heart disease, have high blood pressure, and I know those risk factors can be reversed quickly within 21 days even. So why isn't there a message now, an opportunity to get people's immune systems optimized, eating real food, supplements if necessary, so that when COVID comes, and I even remember saying at that time, it said, we're all going to get it at some point, right? I said that in 2020, people are in the best position to deal with it. So that was my initial stance. But um, I think over time, I became more and more skeptical of the whole lockdown approach. Um, you know, I supported Jay Bhattacharya, who become friends with, and Martin Kuldoff and Sinatra Gupta, who behind the Great Barrington Declaration, saying that we should have had focused protection on the elderly. So that definitely was my stance during 2020. But I was very much focused on, again, using it as an opportunity to get people's lifestyle sorted. And you got the vaccine? Yeah, so then, so we get towards the end of 2020. Even though my, I knew my risk was low, there were a couple of reasons I took it. One was I thought, because I'm a doctor, I would protect my patients. Um, not that I was worried about COVID, but my dad, he had a huge fear that, um, that I was his only surviving relative that I was going to get COVID and die. And we had arguments about it. And ultimately, I was one of the early, earliest people to get two doses of Pfizer yeah, in, in January 2021. And then not long after that, in February, I went on TV on Good Morning Britain um, with a very specific role to play because at that stage, people forget there was no rollout to younger people. There was no mandates or coercion. It was as we've got this vaccine, let's just start and let's offer it to the older people. So that's where, where I came in. I said, okay, fair enough. And there was a hesitancy amongst people from black and ethnic minority communities, right? They were actually the lowest uptake. More people don't know this. If you look at the statistics, government statistics, do you know which group of people had the lowest uptake uh, of the vaccine unvaccinated? Other than social, so social economics, we know. So the poorer people, of course, that's partly because understandably they're disillusioned, right? They're marginalized people of society. Give two fingers to the government telling them what to do, right? So that's one of the reasons. But guess which, which group? I was, I was a bit surprised myself. Muslims. Only 36% of people of Muslim origin in this country took the vaccine. The highest in uh, uptake, more than 80% people of Jewish origin. So I was there on TV to try and reassure them. And I wasn't pointing the finger. I said, listen, I, and this is true at the time, I had never come across anyone with a vaccine injury. I'd never even could even conceive of the idea of someone being vaccine injured or having a vaccine injury, right? I've never come across it, never heard of it. So for me, I couldn't think how can a vaccine, I was a bit skeptical about benefit, I'll be honest, but I didn't think it was going to cause any significant harm. I said, listen, I understand where people are hesitant right? Look at big pharma and all the fraud they do. But when you look at, and I'm a, you know, I'm someone that has studied and campaigned on all the drugs, major drugs that are causing problems in healthcare. Even now, and this is still true, traditional vaccines, and I'm not saying there isn't a problem. I'm sure people listening can say, hold on, so-and-so had an, whatever. I know there's, there's an issue, but it's, it's, but you look at all of the things we do in medicine, James, traditional vaccines are by far the safest. When you look at statins and blood pressure pills and whatever, right? By far the safest, in my view. So that's all I said. And we, we left it there, you know, up until a few months later where uh, my dad um, suffered an unexpected cardiac arrest and died. And uh, he was a very fit guy. And I couldn't explain what happened. I knew that his heart was in pretty good shape. And then the postmortem came through showing two severe blockages. And I still couldn't figure it out. And... And then a few months later, there was research that was published. It didn't get publicized until I publicized it because I thought this needs to hit the news, showing that, um, suggesting that within eight weeks of having two doses of mRNA, Pfizer or Moderna, Mm -hmm. there was an acceleration potential in heart disease and people's risk of a heart attack just within eight weeks, massively from 11% risk at five years to 25%. Extraordinary. And then other bits of data started coming and whistleblowers contacted me, real world data was showing increase in heart disease, heart attacks. So I then started my own critical analysis, did a peer reviewed paper, took nine months, spoke to two Pfizer whistleblowers, you know, vaccine experts, I'm not a vaccine expert, you know, all of that stuff and said, listen, we need to pause. This is, you know, and I was very careful my wording then at the end of 2022 when I published it. But now James, we are dealing with something, honestly, in my view, probably one of the most horrific dare I say it, crimes 
against humanity that we will ever witness in our lifetime, in my view. It is catastrophic what this COVID vaccine has done and is still doing to people. Yeah, the rise in the spike in proteins, the, the blood clots, the heart attacks, depression, and it's all Cancer right. on the autoimmune stuff, cancer's on the increase, and there's a mechanism we know one of the world's most eminent oncologists has said clearly that this is what's going, it's, it's depressing the immune system and it's causing people to who have remission from cancer to have cancer, probably some other mechanism as well that people who are even not at risk of cancer are getting cancer. And we need a kind of, um, we need a, a pause and we need the government and the medical establishment to say, listen, massive problem here. Listen, we thought we were doing the right thing. Our intentions were good. We now realize all this data. We need to stop and we need to now get all the best scientists in the world in the same way they supposedly had all the best scientists in the world saying we need a vaccine quickly. We need the same mindset, the same approach, the same publicity. We now need every sci best, the best medical scientists in the world to figure out what's going on with the vaccine injured. How can we help them? What about people that haven't got clear symptoms at the moment? Are they at risk of cancer in the next few years? Heart disease? How do we manage that? How do we identify that? How do we treat it? Yeah, so that's the thing with me. So on the radio, maybe five, 10 years ago, they used to say one in two had cancer. And I think that number's just far too high. Like, I can't see four billion people having that. Was that them planting the seeds for what's to come 10 years later? No, I don't think so. I think ultimately when people die, we've all got to go. Yeah. Very few people, uh, James, die of old, actual old age. I would love to die of old age. Uh -huh. No actual condition. Go to sleep, don't wake up. Yeah. Maybe you're 100, you know? Get to 100 just because it's a nice number, right? Mm. Um, but ultimately, people will die of something. And when they say one in two, they you know, of, if it's not heart disease, it's going to be cancer. You know, that's uh, it's 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 also something that can happen as you get older. Should we be dying of something though? Is this the way? No, of not the, necessarily. Is no. this the way of the world? No, or I don't think was so. It like five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, uh, Native Americans, nature. Do you know? Great question. Don't know the answer to that, but theoretically, no, we shouldn't be dying of anything. Have we just accepted that though? I think so. Because so. of the foods, the alcohol, Absolutely. the smoking, the stress, yeah. the depression, everything sprayed. People laugh when I talk about them spraying the sky, spraying our foods, spraying our waters. You know, like, should it be like that? And will we ever see change? Because if people get vaccinated, where it can then take a turn for the worst in five years, 10 years, people who are fit and healthy now, population drops down, you, all of a sudden you've only got three, 400 million people on the planet. Like, Things can be wiped out. And like I say, in 100 years, this will be forgotten because the history books can be rewritten, which they've done through time. But if we make it through to 100 years, mate, I mean, the way the world's going right now, who knows we're going to even make it there? You know, there might, the, the, people's health is getting worse. Mentally, they're getting worse. They're more angry. There's more hostility. We've got potentially World War Three on the cards. I mean, that is my biggest fear, that we may not even make it for another 100 years. But again, the media... So we've got, so we've got to do something about it now. And having even this conversation is so important. People thinking differently. Saying, hold on, I'm not going to accept this. Even if I not, may, may not be here in 30 or 40 years' time, what about my kids? I care about them. I want them to have a good future and my grandkids. So we let's sort it out for them. So everyone needs to stand up. I mean, one of the things that we're doing to, you know, there's different ways of trying to get this information out uh, on this. I remember we, I messaged you about it before, obviously, the, the podcast as well, in terms of, you know, having the, a part of the discussion on this as well, is that we have, there's a petition going around. Um, uh, it's called the Hope Accord, and it's been set up by doctors. I'm one of the founding members. We've got 40,000 signatures on it, more than 1,000 doctors basically saying the mRNA technology needs to be paused. It's very carefully worded. We're not being over the top with it. We need to sort out and help the vaccine injured. We need to look at the root cause of how this happened and why it happened. And then we also need to come back to basics of medical ethics. So we've got thrown out the window, informed consent. And actually, that could be a, a spark or, or a tipping point. And it would be, James, once people realize, and most people realize, oh my God, this mRNA vaccine should never have been put into my body. And these are the, uh, then they'll, uh, the, and the root causes of that, the whole system gets exposed and we can rebuild it. Do you believe the vaccine killed your dad? Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it in the medical journal as well, and it was accepted that that was a possibility. Um, in my mind, absolutely, 100%. How does that make you feel? <sighs> so many mixed feelings, James, to be honest. Um, you know, I've had so many uh, sad, extremely sad, uh, angry at times. Um, I miss him. He didn't deserve to, to be injected with this product that should never have been approved by the regulator. But at the same time, I've got to say, well, listen, suffering is a part of life. Things happen. How do I turn 
his death and my grief into something that can help other people. And that's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, man, I would get a fucking flamethrower, man. And I don't know what I would do. Um, I know my mum got it. She worked, she was at a home help and done amazing work with the elderly and stuff. So I understand people getting it, try to save lives and do the right thing. I try to say to listen. But again, I'm not a doctor or a scientist because if I'd got it wrong, then I've got blood in my hands. Of course. You know, so it's a difficult one. And yeah. Like I said, I'm and you like, And you went, and James, yeah. let's be honest, a lot of people went with their intuition. Yeah. And their intuition was right. And we, there, this is something I think that, you know, some of the people who are now saying, I told you so, I mean, it's not about that. No, we want, no, we're no. all we're all part of the same family. Mm -hmm. We want to help each other. We need to, uh, you, we got it right this time, but does that mean throughout your whole life, you've always got everything right with, you know, it's just, it, it's good. Yeah. I'm glad, you know, I wish I'd been that person. Mm -hmm. That didn't take it. One of my, I, I'm not someone that lives with regrets. I'm not. I don't believe in that because I think life. You take what life throws at you, and you try and make the best of it. Mm -hmm. And you learn from those situations rather than regret. But if there was only one, one regret I have in my life, it was having that injected into my body, because yeah. I'm living with uncertainty. I'm not in the best state uh, mentally since that. Um, you know, I've got a flare up of psoriasis. I'd cured it years ago with this autoimmune condition for the skin. I've been told that my gut microbiome has been damaged by the vaccine by a very eminent gastroenterologist in America who's done an analysis of it and said, you have got the signature of vaccine injured. And there's uncertainty. Is this gonna get better? Is me taking probiotics and doing other things gonna help me? I really don't know. I've got to do the best of it uh, with what I've got. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's dark at times thinking, well, Jesus, yeah. I wish I never had this in my body. And a lot of people done got the vaccine for the greater good and thinking they were doing the yeah. right thing. So that's why it's important not to go, yeah, I told you so. Because I, like I say, I took drinking drugs. I didn't give a fuck what I was putting into my body. Yeah. But it's just when you become older and you just look at things differently and you think, that just doesn't sit right with me. Why are they promoting that? Even the wars and stuff, I think. It's just been going on for thousands of years. Nothing changes. It's all corruption. If there's wars, people make more money in the, the weapons yeah. industry and it's just it all works hand in hand it all works together dumb them down feed them this give them this brainwash them to fight in wars like there shouldn't be wars there shouldn't be destruction there shouldn't be pain there shouldn't be misery we've just conditioned ourselves so much we've accepted it and it's time to go do you know what fuck this man I'm su and I said this the last podcast I'm surprised the streets aren't packed they aren't packed it's because people, people not enough people know James what's happened I think you know? they are. I just think people are scared, even in the medical Maybe. industry. People yeah. have got a good wage, they've got a good salary, yeah. living a nice little life, yeah. don't want to rock the boat. I, and I understand that. I well. get approached by people all the time, random people in the street. Thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, there was a doctor last week, I won't name him, but he's well known, a bit older, experienced doctor. Mm -hmm. um, he came to see me and he was really emotional. And I, I don't know this guy. And he just said, um, I just want to thank you for everything you've been doing on the vaccine stuff. He says, I know it's a problem. It killed one of my colleagues. And he was very honest. He said, I'm just too frightened to speak out. He just used those words. Yeah, it's scary. It is, it's scary. So. This is people's livelihood. People are just content living their own little life, their own little bubble, going yeah. home and feeding their family. It's all right in the short term though, James, but not speaking the truth, it leads to problems down yeah. the line. It's not yeah. going to go away. No. And these and this is not going to be swept on the carpet. Big Pharma are going to just keep pushing this stuff. It looks as if it's going to get worse. Yeah. So vaccines, let's talk about vaccines. Does it take five years, 10 years to create a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, I... Is that I, a myth or I, what? I, I don't I, know. I had no expertise, even basic expertise yeah, on vaccines because it's not something I've ever given anybody and I'm a cardiologist, mm -hmm. etc. I've received it, of course. I've had so many vaccines as a kid. Um, but yes, normal traditional vaccines, five to 10 years of safety checks before they're approved. Five to 10 years. And what was Pfizer? Two years? Not even that, a year. The vaccines have rolled out, what, 13 billion, 14 billion of them? worldwide yeah i don't know that must be yeah, sounds about right and i think in the uk over 93 percent of people got the vaccine yeah and in fact you know i uh, we've calculated people ask me what's the harm rate um serious adverse event rate in the short term is about one in 800 which is not a small amount probably goes up with time it could be as high as one in 200 or one in 300 of serious harm death rate ballpark possibly probably one in a thousand you know, which means if you've vaccinated 3 billion people, you're going to kill 3 million. And it, and it didn't really have any massive effect on reducing COVID deaths, to be honest. And when you look at the balance of risks and benefits from Pfizer and Moderna's own trials, you were more likely, and this has been reanalyzed now and published in a journal, but it's not being discussed in the mainstream. From the very beginning, you were more likely to suffer serious harm from the vaccine than you were to be hospitalized with COVID. You know, and that's before the, and that's even ignoring 
the fact that in 2020 we had all these other things that we could have told people to do whether it was take high dose vitamin c eat real food get their vitamin d levels up that probably would have been you know would have shown that the the harm rate from the vaccine was massively higher than the benefit of it if people were doing that what actually was covid was it just a flu ultimately yeah i mean it is a bit of i an, had it twice it is a bit of an unusual virus yeah i uh, had the fucker twice it was yeah. painful yeah and, and I've, had, I've got a few patients who never got vaccinated yeah. who've suffering from a long covid symptoms and really suffering um not to say the vaccine would have helped them but there was definitely something yeah. unusual about the, the about covid um but yeah i mean it's a it's just like it, it's a cold virus if you like but had some unusual features early on and i think it was unusual because it we now know it came out of a lab it was human engineered but the majority of disease is, it's all man-made. <laughs> well, you can go down the rabbit hole yeah, so deep when yeah. you ask the question and think, well, why is that here? Because the immune system is a powerful thing, but for yeah. people to get two vaccines and a booster, still wear a mask and still end up with fucking COVID. Yeah, but what, and then what? still have another vaccine. I know that tells you, I mean, again, it's just how people were brainwashed by the fear. Because you think it's not rational behavior, but human beings predominantly are emotional more than they are rational. So the emotion was so strong of that fear that they were literally compliant to do anything they were told by the authorities. That's what they did. And there was a psychological operation in that involved yeah. in getting people the propaganda behind it. Absolutely. Does that not scare you how fast the world can be locked down and people can be jumping through? It, it, it's scary, but it's also empowering because once you, once you see it, James, you understand it, you can talk about it and you can say, hold on a minute, we're not going to let this happen again. And this is why even us having this conversation, there's no way people are, listen, Let's say, never say never, but I think it's highly unlikely they would have the same compliance if they come out again and say, we've got a new pandemic and we've got this vaccine for you. People are going to, I don't think people are going to accept it. See, I and that's, think, when the riots, yeah. that's when the riots will happen. Listen, and if it, and, and I'll be, I'll yeah, be, I'll be. if that's what it needs to take, I'm going to be at the fucking front. I'm not giving a fuck because I thought I was going crazy. Fuckers were trying to make me go crazy. Because I was questioning it, get yourself in nature, walk a mountain. I heard saunas were good for it. Like I say, I'm not a medical doctor, but apparently it killed the virus, whatever it was. The heat as well was so important. But yeah. again, I'm not a scientist. No. I just know my life is going okay at the moment. But again, it's it's so difficult because so many people were against you. And now people are starting to waken up. It just scares me that there could be something else in three years, five years, and people just then follow suit again. And that's not what it's about, man. Like people can have such an amazing life, and and it's scary because, like you say, if that's one in two hundred, that's those. What should, what should that actually be for a vaccine? If a, 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 I say vaccine, one in a hundred thousand, one in no, a million. Pub, pub, one published data, and I'm sure this is it's an exaggerated safety from what we know of drug industry, but it gives you a ballpark figure: one in a million, one in one to two per million from a, 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 from traditional vaccines, serious serious adverse event. Versus one in 800. Because people will get allergic reactions or some sort yeah. of reaction to something which is yeah. understandable. Yeah. But it's serious, saving more lives. Yeah, but ser serious is it causes a disability, causes you to be hospitalized, or it's life-changing in some way. So what is the the main destruction from the vaccine? I know heart attacks of worldwide is over 30% now on the rise. And um, blood clots, depression. Like what? What's it targeting? Well, what every, is everybody ev different? Every organ system, unfortunately, mate. The spike protein, which is where the worst effects of COVID in the vulnerable people happens, it causes inflammation in the tissues. It goes, you know, uh, the injection in your arm, the the damaging effect of the of the vaccine basically goes into every organ system potentially: brain, heart, kidneys, liver, ovaries, testes, you name it, skin. Um, and we're seeing that. And in fact, I'm not just making that up the world health organization themselves endorsed a list of potential serious adverse effects that can happen from the vaccine when it was rolled out nobody knew about it because it wasn't publicized every single organ system is affected in that and anything and everything that can go wrong with the heart is in that now, i'm not saying everybody's going to get that but that's the potential which means that it can do anything and everything and why was bill gates involved um well bill gates uh, has a personal belief and ideology in vaccines and patented drugs and making money from McDonald's and Coca-Cola, which he's invested in, for example, doesn't care about chronic disease. Um, you have to ask Bill Gates. But what I can say is Bill Gates himself has made half a billion dollars from investments in the COVID vaccine. And he's also the second largest funder of the World Health Organization. So imagine this guy's making money out of advice that's going to make him more money, which is not independent or transparent. And in fact, has been a bloody disaster, a public health disaster. He's one of the most evil men on the planet. Huh? 
Well, I don't, I might personal view, James, I don't think anyone's, I think good and evil runs, you know, the line between good and evil runs down to every human heart. But to cause destruction for your own personal gain. Is, I mean, but, but you know, let's, Payne Dev's advocate, it may well be fully believes that he's done the right thing. He's, I, I think, I you know, so. evil is rooted in ignorance. Mm -hmm. But what's worse than ignorance? Do you think he's just seen it as a business? The illusion of knowledge. I think that's a big aspect of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because and, and money clouds judgment, mate, you know? Yeah. But still, man, you still know right from wrong. And if it's hurting other people to... I'd love to have a conversation with Bill Gates, actually. And I think I'd, I'd hope that that two-way conversation, we'd both learn something from each other. But hopefully he would learn from me that modern medicine is not an exact science, right? And I think that's one of the myths that needs to be busted first for him. He probably t treats medicine and drugs like technology. You know, if it does this, if this drug, this pill lowers your blood pressure or gives you an antibody, then it's going to work and it's 100%. He doesn't realize that's not true in medicine. And Pfizer, did it make over 100 billion? Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, those, the, uh, those corporations have been diagnosed as being psychopathic in the way they make money. And um, I, my personal view is they had the information and data before the vaccine was rolled out to say there's a problem here and it shouldn't have been rolled out. I think when they realized it was causing serious harm, genuinely in the population, and they realized it wasn't stopping transmission or infection, they then doubled down on making sure that mandates happened. Think about that, to distract from just how bad this vaccine was so they could also make as much money as possible. Because if you get into the mindset, if governments are saying we're gonna mandate it, there's an element of you think, oh, it must be really safe then. They're now gonna mandate the vaccine. It must, be so, it must be safe. So that's what they exploited. So at the top, you've got Big Pharma who then create this and then push it down to the doctors. How much do doctors get paid to then give out a vaccine? And the NHS don't get paid. I mean, I don't know for sure what happened here. I think GPs were given a bit of extra money for extra work, fine, mm -hmm. you know, managing vaccine centers, I get that. But gen generally, there is no direct payment going to doctors from the drug industry in this country. We're very good at it. What happens is they influence the guideline bodies that the doctors then follow, and that's how the money is made. Doctors, by and large, I mean... You know, GPs used to be salaried. Now they have a bit more that they can make from doing different things. But it's not like America where there, there's more direct payments going to doctors. So I don't think it's about individual doctors getting paid directly, jobbing doctors. But I think it's about the medical figures in positions of power. They're the ones that get to their, you know, get their universities getting hundreds of millions for example from the drug industry get to positions of power and for them it's more the power than the money james as well most people are going to the medical profession certainly in this country to make money if you want to make money become a banker right doctors don't go they, fine it's a good life it, you, you've got a decent you know you've got a reasonable amount of money that you're earning that gives you you know you can have a house and maybe a nice car whatever else but doctors primarily in my view are not motivated by making money when it goes to medicine. They, they do it because they enjoy the the science and they like doing what they, you know. They, they enjoy the job. They want to help people. Um, so it's a it, certainly in this country. America is a bit different. I think I think the average doctor in America is a millionaire. How many vaccines did they roll out for? Was it four different vaccines? Um, in this country, as far as I know, it was Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and there was Johnson and Johnson, I think, which was used in America in more, but then it got stopped. And early you, on. people can't even sue these companies now because they're. But this is why we need to change our economic system, James. People don't understand. The corporate capitalism also means that there is limited liability for shareholders if a company does something dodgy. So this is where we have to, and this has not happened through democratic discussion, right? If we had had a discussion at the beginning with the public and say, by the way, just, you know, before you take this vaccine, you know, if anything happens to you, you can't sue the drug companies. Why was that not part of the discussion? People would have said, hold on a minute, that sounds a bit dodgy. How is that? That is in law, enshrined in law, because of corporations um, influencing the law over the years by lobbying politicians and, and getting people, uh, you know, politicians who are basically being taking money or um, having committees when it comes to legislation that are have got lobbyists or people working for the industry there. This is how they do it. So people need to understand how this has all happened. It's actually happened through legal mechanisms, which we have not agreed to, which means these are unjust laws not democratic and they're not just because mm -hmm. i've spoke to people who's lost legs lost arms i know it's terrible and um it's unbelievable it's absolute madness what yeah. what do you think the whole effect of it will be in time do you think it can get worse or do you think a lot of people's over the worst or do you think it's sitting there because people say it'll change the dna people now obviously cardiac arrest is on the rise all the football players dropping yeah. down like do you think from a heart disease point of view i think we're going to see excess deaths and heart attacks increasing over the next several years above what they should be for sure 
because I know the mechanism. It, it stu- even if you've got a bit of furring, it's accelerating it. So let's say, for example, James, you have a crystal ball, you're destined to have a heart attack. I'm not saying you, but let's just say you're destined to have a heart attack in, in 40 <laughs> years or 30 years or whatever. He's Suddenly you're having it in a year or two years, you know, or whatever. So yeah. it's accelerated that process. The other stuff, I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer. And I want, it. I want the answer. I want to understand exactly what's going on, you know, with the best medical minds to look at and understand what's happening. Is it changing DNA, whatever else? Um, is it putting people at risk of cancer? If it is, what's the antidote? We want an antidote. Is there a supplement people can take? Is there, a, is there actually a drug that they can use to, you know, a, a genuinely useful drug that can be used to help us? We don't know the answer. See, I think that's the most important yeah. question. Yeah. Can it be reversed? Yeah. Can people be cured? Yeah. Has anybody reversed that? I know there's something called Gold Dick, Gold something. Um, John, who's a good friend of mine. Gold Dick or something. Gold, yeah, John, who... John uh, Watt. Yeah, John Watt. Shout out to John. Um, had them on a podcast two or three years ago. YouTube took it down. Um, but that's the most important question because people will be listening to this and we're giving them more fear. They're already in fear. And obviously, try to waking people up, you're drilling them with more fear. I know. And that's the fucking sad reality. It People is. need to wake up and go, well, wait a minute. Yeah. What is going on? Why did they roll out a vaccine that was created in under two years or 18 months or whatever it was? Yeah. Um, and then one in 200 people could possibly lose their life or get injured. Or, that's some fucking big numbers, that. And what happens? Because I see the streets. The streets ain't as busy as it used to be. And I don't know if I'm paranoid because I know people were getting knocked down with buses and dying, being stabbed or shot, but they were signing it off as COVID because... They had COVID two weeks before, so they were making it as a COVID death. Like, the numbers, I don't know, but the streets don't look as busy. I don't know if people are still in the house with fear because of a lockdown for two, three years. Yeah, The streets don't feel the same anymore. There's no. a different vibe, especially in London. It doesn't feel the same. Do you become a threat? I mean, I don't put, I don't try, I try not to make it personal. I think the message is a threat to Big Pharma. I'm just a medium for that message. But yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, if they're if they're attacking you and smearing you in the press, and you know, after I went on the BBC to talk about statins and excess deaths, I talked about the vaccine, and suddenly there's a front, you know, main story. The Guardian was a hatchet job on me. Um, I saw it as a, I saw it as a reflection of actually getting the truth out there, because you know, Gandhi, who's one of my inspirations, said first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you. And you win if you get if they're fight, starting to fight us then it means we're over the target and it means the information they're threatened by the message so yeah absolutely uh, i'm sure the message is a massive threat but we keep pushing forward what should people be questioning i think they should be well so many things but when it comes to their health i think the the, the most important thing for me right for me as a person and for me as a doctor um and for me as a public health activist or campaigner is how do does one what is how can you optimize your mental physical and social well-being i think that's the most important thing for people in life how do you be the best version of yourself mentally physically emotionally right and that's what it's so you've got to ask yourself if i'm not in that state why am i not in that state and could it be that I'm not getting the full total information and advice from my doctor, not because he's Ill, you know, malicious, but because the doctor himself is also being misled. Those, that's where people need to start questioning things. And then what can I do about this? And once they become privy to the information that we're sharing and talking about today, they need to start making noise. Because it is a lot for people to look at what's in the foods. It's not about looking at calories, it's about what's in it, what chemicals is uh, in James, it. James, absolutely. That's why we need... So the whole point of government is to allow society to flourish in a way where we all mutually get on with each other, we compromise about disagreements, but also one of the most primary purposes of government is to protect their populations from disease. And you're absolutely right. What, how can, what can people believe, right? If the government have allowed ultra-processed foods to be the predominant part of our diet is going to make us sick not deliberately but they are the same people that are going to protect the population from the manipulations of these big corporations right so that's why government needs to come in and that's why but the government will respond to the people and the, and hopefully there are people that are having i've had conversations with politicians james across both several you know cross party and 
a lot of them are shocked by the information I, I tell them. They trust me. A lot of them come to me for medical advice. And I'm like, and, they, and they, even they feel powerless sometimes. They think the big pharma or the corporations are bigger than them on their own to speak out. You saw what happened to Andrew Bridgen. Andrew Bridgen was an MP that came to my talk in parliament about the vaccine. He then took it on board himself very courageously. He was a lone figure and they went after him, you know, and he lost his seat. You know, he, he got expelled from the party. So this is not for um, shrinking violets, but if that, it doesn't take many people to stand together to speak out. And it's much harder for them to attack a group than it is an individual. Yeah, but there's not many. And look at how can you trust the government when they're putting everyone in lockdown? There's people never went to their baby's birth. There's people never got medical treatment. There's people died. People couldn't even. We have to demand. We have to demand from our government. They're partying and fucking Christmas all drunk. Like how can people? We we have. They can't. No, they can't. We have to demand better leadership, and we need those leaders and people to speak out and to start showing themselves and their true colours about we genuinely are in this profession, in this job. Because we are serving you, the public, not lining our own pockets or not being slaves of corporate psychopaths. How powerful is Big Pharma? I think they're the most powerful entity on the, on the planet. Who's behind, I think they're a mafia. Who's behind them? Just money, greed. What you said at the beginning, it's greed. It's materialism. It's a mindset. It's an economic system that is just there to extract money from the public through deception and they don't care who they harm in the process. Yeah, listen, I, I know friends who've sold drugs for years. They didn't care who they harmed. And that's, that's petty. F- too much they were making towards the trillions that these industries are making. So, like we said, it's that money's the root of all evil. It's the fucking root of all evil and the destruction that but, goes. But, but the way forward, I think, James, as well, is, is, is first of all, people understanding and acknowledging and exposing the system properly, how we've got here, and then we can change it. You make the injustice visible. You know, that's what Gandhi, one of his... Um, you know, his uh, slogans, if you like, make the injustice visible. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's what we're all trying to do so that we can create a better world. Um, and there are different mechanisms of doing that. Um, I'm just in the process of, you know, think about different medium you, that individuals can use to change people's minds. It can be through conversation with your mates, your neighbor, your family. It can be you know, showing them clips of this conversation or other things all on to alternative media, just to get them to think outside the box a little bit. But one of the mechanisms or ways, which is quite powerful, of course, is through writing and words uh, and documentaries. And um, because of all of this, I thought, you know, this is a great opportunity now to unravel all of the layers of how the drug industry and the economic system is damaging people's health and misleading them deliberately. And also the alternative side on health. You know, one of my areas of interest, which is fascinating, is actual reversal of heart disease blockages of, you know, that develop in people's hearts, which most cardiologists think is not possible. And certainly members of the public won't think it's possible. And exploring those ideas, I wouldn't say I've got the definitive answer. People are going to have to see the documentary, but that's something we're in the process of finishing at the moment called First Do No Farm. And um, and I think that, you know, for me, that's the next big step. And if we get that to as many millions of people watch that, it's game over. What do you think makes a better world? Uh, I think a world where people start from a place of understanding that what's most important is actually our relationships with each other and those relationships being strong are based upon trust being authentic um looking after each other knowing that we're all one big family ultimately we don't live in cocoons you know um if even if your life is good in a certain way you're not going to be happy as as happy as you could be if the world around you is burning. So I think it comes from that acceptance and understanding. What do you think life is? Why do you think we're here? <laughs> wow. Why are we here? Who knows the answer to that? Don't know. Don't know why we're here. But the fact is we are here and I think we've got to make the best of it and, and live our lives, which are a life which is meaningful. We're all going to go at some point. Do you think we'll ever see a, a better world? Because I think, the way wars are going, destruction, the media, social media, the foods, do you think we'll get enough people to see it differently and become a better place? Because there's so much, if you go down we, the street, yeah. you see so much beautiful stuff in Scotland, it's all beauty. Yeah. The mountains, everything is, you don't see people fighting and arguing and hating on each other. Sometimes the media can portray the world as a bad place when really it is good. Like, But to people to really get into their true intention, their true source, and cutting back all the negatives and, and yeah. raising their vibration to be spiritual beings. We're all spiritual beings. Some people say energy, avatars, aliens. Yeah. Whatever the fuck we are, I, I genuinely yeah. don't know. But 
Um, like it's just to see it. Do you ever think we'll get the pieces to then for people to then really connect think, and have a better? I think we have to, James. We, our, our best option is to have hope. Yeah, and um, because pessimism is surrender, and despair is defeat. So we need to have hope. You know, and as Saint Augustine said, hope has two beautiful daughters: anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, and courage to make them the way they ought to be. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep pushing forward, mate. For anybody watching, obviously listening or watching, um, and it's maybe a little panic now because obviously certain things that we spoke about, what can they read up on? What can they watch to then try and educate themselves to try and try and Listen, fix things? one thing they can also do to, honestly, I'm not joking about this, that is going to empower them to feel they're contributing and it will have impact. You know, this petition that we've we've set up called the Hope Accord, if they go just Google Hope Accord, mm -hmm. And maybe put my name as Seema Hotra, something will come up and they can read it and they can add their name to it and spread it around, read what's on there. That is going to get us quicker to a situation where the government, the establishment are going to say, hold on a minute, we need to stop this vaccine rollout, we need to help the vaccine injured, etc. So I think that definitely is one thing they can do. Um, if they're interested in hearing about me and my work on the holistic health side and what's the truth, etc., then they can follow me on Twitter. I'm Dr. Asim Hotra. Um, and uh, I put out a lot of educational stuff. Where do you go forward for the future, brother? Well, uh, next thing, of course, is trying to get this documentary out and making it global and going around the world with it, hopefully September, October. Um, you try to raise funding for that as well for people to back yeah, it? Yeah, so, yeah, so we, we're crowdfunding it because we didn't want to have any commercial influence. So there's no branding or supplement company no or anything farmers, like that. No big farm. Definitely not a big farmer, mate. No, buddy, <laughs> no. Um, so they can go to nofarmfilm.com yeah. and they can see the initial kind of trailer that we made. That's, um, so they can look at that and, and they can contribute whatever they help. I mean, in the ideal world, we need some big donors to come in for the distribution and the graphics and the high quality edit. We're still probably about two hundred fifty thousand pounds short. If someone's listening and they want to help and support in any way, and of course, we'd be very welcome to to receive that. But um, whatever people can contribute. But either way, we're going to get this out and we're going to disseminate it. And we've got a lot of powerful backers in terms of people that are going to hopefully support it and promote it, with the likes of Joe Rogan, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to make this a global movie. Yeah, your podcast one was unbelievable, by the way. So just before we finish up, for anybody that's struggling with depression or anything, any advice for them? Well, listen, honestly, you're, <laughs> it sounds strange, but do all, if you're struggling with depression, definitely speak to your doctor. I mean, a lot of the doctors now realize there's a big problem of over-medication of antidepressants, but you might be in that category where antidepressants will help you. And I've used it on patients before that needed it, not on everybody, and it massively helped them to get them out of it. But yeah, I mean, the things to look at, I mean, if they want a book to realize a lot of it is related to even lifestyle and food. I mean, if they lose a bit of weight, eat better, mental health gets better. So if there's one book that they might want to read that is easy to read, um, of course, I'm plugging it, but I mean, of course, you know, uh, if people want, I'm quite proud of this work, is my third book was called A Statin-Free Life, How to Prevent, Manage Heart Disease, Improve Lifestyle, Immune, so everything's in there. So mm. they can get that on, I think it's about six quid on Amazon. Brother, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, I think, listen, um, all I would say is, People are going to be confused. They're going to be angry. They're going to be upset. I think just dig down and just try and see this opportunity um, of, of suffering that we're experiencing. I've, I've lost all my immediate family uh, over the years and uh, so in the last few years to failings in the healthcare system, both my mum and my dad. Um, I live alone, you know, and it's been tough and I, I, I empathize. I, I, but you've got to try and do your best to turn that suffering to something positive yeah. and just have hope things will get better right but just try and speak out if you can speak your truth tell people what you think do you think it's easier to do what you're doing because you are alone now because if you had other people around you maybe it's, you don't want to upset them because they come for them as well do you think your mission is, no. now, is now clear or do you think you'd have always done it no matter i would have what? always done it because i was doing it even before but if anything i miss my parents a lot they were massive support to me with everything i was doing mm -hmm. they never you know it's tough but yeah but I'm, i want to use that that grief, if you like, that sadness I experienced so that nobody else suffers the same way I did. Mm -hmm. Dr. Asim, listen, thanks for giving me your time today. James, thank keep you. up the great work. I know you're in a rush, mate, so I don't want to keep you too long, but we will go again Absolutely. in the future. And uh, like I say, keep up the amazing work. I wish you nothing but the best and anything I can help with, you know where I am. Thank you, James. God bless you, brother. Appreciate it.